<clears throat> Thank you, uh, Regina. You did your homework uh, there. Um, Thank you for that introduction. And thank all of you who are here today from the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet. You do good and important work. How about a round of applause for them? <clears throat> okay, I wanna say right off that this was not an easy group to write a speech for. Uh, I thought we might have a room full of enthusiastic readers and writers, but otherwise quite a mix. College students, university professors, businessmen and women, elementary school teachers, high schoolers, and a dancer or two. And we do. And my brother Mike is here. So we have at least one art historian with us today. Let's see, who else is here? Hmm, um, there's an interesting diversity. Let's see, I think we have a former um, U.S. diplomat here. I think we have a uh, award-winning uh, journalist. Uh, once a journalist, always a journalist, Tom. Um, we have uh, two publishers of, of poetry. Um, let's see. Um, university professors of various kinds. Anyway, uh, I didn't know how to get started. So I thought, when in doubt, start with mom. <laughs> My mother, Peg, is at least partly responsible for me being here today. Beyond getting me into this world, she gave me a gift when I was nine years old that changed my life. A Christmas gift, a book titled The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Though I had an impressive collection of comic books, this was my first encounter with literature. On a bitter cold night in 1956, lying in bed with at least two blankets covering me, a hot cup of cocoa within arm's reach, and this book now in my grasp, Literature worked its magic on me that night. I was Tom Sawyer in that cave with Becky. I was Tom Sawyer in the graveyard with Huck. I happily discovered that artful language can take us on a magic carpet ride into other lives and other times. I would guess that most of you here can pinpoint such an experience. So it starts with falling in love with reading with books. All writers were readers first, of course. As our reading life continued, somewhere along the line, we thought it might be interesting to try our hand at writing the kind of thing we had been reading and admired. Saul Bellow says somewhere that a writer is a reader moved to emulation. And if you're lucky enough to live in Kentucky, there are dozens of writers past and present worthy of this writerly emulation. It didn't take long for poetry to hook me. My junior year at Wichita State, I took a poetry writing class from a wonderful teacher and poet, Michael Van Walligan. Our text for, uh, for the course was an anthology that included poems by Theodore Retke, William Stafford, Denise Levertov, James Wright, Philip Levine, Sylvia Plath, and others. I learned what I could from these terrific writers, and I'm still learning from them. I wrote my first really bad poems, and I absolutely knew by the end of this class that I wanted to spend the rest of my life writing poetry. Many of us here, I think, can, pin, can point to one teacher who essentially changed our life. Michael was that teacher for me. We stayed in touch over the years, and early on I told him he was primarily responsible for putting me on the path I've taken, the poetry path. His response, I hope you can come to forgive me. <laughs> the most essential thing to my development as a poet since I moved to Kentucky in 1986 has been the poetry group that Marsha Herlow and I started soon after I arrived here. 
After a lot of creative and, frankly, ingenious thought, we decided to call this group the Lexington Frankfurt Poetry Group. <laughs> Marcia and I had both graduated from MFA programs and knew how useful the workshop model could be. And I'm happy to give a public shout out to the group's other longtime members too. Richard Taylor, Letha Kendrick, Mike Moran, Tom Webster, George Ella Lyon, Kim Miller, and Susan Coben. You've all made me a better poet, and our gatherings underscored the truth that poets can not only be solitary scribblers, but can also profit immensely from a supportive community. And way before this group was formed, I had a special in-house reader of my work, my wife Linda, who has always been ready, willing, and able to comment on my fledgling drafts. She brings to the task nearly 40 years of teaching German literature and writing and publishing scholarly articles. She is a talented, close reader and has been my frontline crap detector ever since I met her. Supporting me in the early days when I was sending out my poems to magazines and getting almost all of them back. They'll catch on, Linda said, the morning before the mailman brought me the happy news that both the Georgia Review and Poetry Northwest wanted my poems. There's someone else here I want to thank publicly, Susan Stemple. By the time I moved to Lexington, I had been teaching literature and writing courses for 14 years at various universities. I was ready to try something new. Someone at UK mentioned that the university had a research magazine, Odyssey, and maybe I could do some freelance writing for the magazine. I met with Susan and assured her my qualifications were impeccable. I had never written a feature article in my life <laughs> and knew next to nothing about science. <laughs> Susan rolled the dice and hired me anyway. She happened to be desperate for a writer. And it turned out we worked very well together. Odyssey won over a dozen local, regional, and national awards in the years to come. And my poetic sensibilities were helped considerably by my work with the magazine. I learned a lot about science, medical research, social sciences, all new fodder for my poetry. How has reading and writing poetry made my life richer, better? There are poems that have literally changed my life because they have altered the way I look at and listen to the world. Poetry lifts the veil from the hidden beauty of the world and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar, Shelley tells us. And one of the effective and interesting ways poets do this, as we know, is through metaphor. As an example, here's the last stanza of one of my very favorite Mary Oliver poems, Little Owl Who Lives in the Orchard. Somewhere in the universe, in the gallery of important things, the babyish owl, ruffled and rakish, sits on its pedestal. Dear dark dapple of plush, a message reads the label from that mysterious conglomerate oblivion and company. The hooked head stares from its house of dark feathery lace. It could be a valentine. An ideal ending for a poem makes a sound like the click of a lid of a perfectly made box, William Butler Yeats tells us. And this resolution can also contain an unexpected wallop, a happy surprise. It could be a valentine. Where did this come from? An owl's face is a valentine. Now I see that. And ever since reading this poem, whenever I see an owl's face, it is also a valentine, my valentine. And my life is a little richer for this. For a poet who immerses herself in metaphor, the literal and the metaphorical are sometimes experienced almost simultaneously. I was driving one winter a few years ago with Richard Taylor. 
we were on our way to visit Gray Zeitz at Larkspur Press. And somewhere between Frankfurt and Monterey, we went along a stretch of highway where ice had cascaded down some limestone cliffs. Look at those amazing beards of ice, Richard said. I just thought the exact same thing, I added. Of course you did, Richard said. <laughs> Metaphor allows us to re-envision re and better appreciate the world that we move through. In my, in my limited time today, I'll mention one other important thing that poetry can do. It can change our sensibilities and enlarge our sense of empathy. Here's a poem by Wesley McNair, The Puppy. From down the road, starting up and stopping once more, the sound of a puppy on a chain who has not yet discovered he will spend his life there. Foolish dog to forget where he is and wander until he feels the collar close fast around his throat. Then cry all over again about the little space in which he finds himself. Soon, when there is no grass left in it, and he understands it is all he has, he will snarl and bark whenever he senses a threat to it. Who would believe this small sorrow could lead to such fury? No one would ever come near him. Does this poem make you angry? It, it makes me angry all over again every time I read it. In just a few lines, McNair has shown us the effect of human cruelty to an animal, sad and tragic in part because all of us have probably witnessed such a scene or, in an even wider sense, experienced human cruelty to other animals. I believe the best poems, like this one, explore what it's like to live on this earth in the here and now. Poetry is a human art that, sp that springs straight from the blood and mire of a person's existence. I'm thrilled to be named Kentucky's new Poet Laureate, and in the past couple of weeks, I've talked with several of our former Poets Laureate to find out what I'm in for. I mean, uh, what I have to look forward to. <laughs> One of my questions I ask of our former laureates has been, is there anything anybody asked you that you just didn't have an answer for? George Ella won the prize in this category. She told me last week that in a third grade class in Lexington Elementary School, a girl shot her arm up in the air and said, when you get this job, does it come with an outfit? <laughs> uh, George Ella, I, I, I forgot to ask, how did you, how did you answer that? I, I forgot to ask you. <laughs> what was that? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and Tom, that reminds me, wherever you are. Uh, um, how's the budget look for, for, for this uh, thing? Because, you know, obviously I could use a new outfit or two. Uh, I'm thinking a sombrero and a cape. Could, 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 could you do that? During my two-year tenure, I plan to visit colleges and high schools throughout the state. English classes, poetry clubs, and special events, perhaps. I look forward to reading poems, mine and others, in public libraries in Kentucky, book clubs, civic groups, and writing workshops. I look forward to talking about Kentucky's literary history, and I'm eager to do some traveling around the state. I have a peppy Subaru Impreza that's a joy to drive. I have Sirius Radio, and I've locked one of my stations onto the Beatles channel. You might even hear me on the outskirts of your town singing along loud with John, Paul, George, and Ringo. They count on me by now to help them out. <laughs> the Fab Five coming to your town. I also plan to play a supporting role on a project that just came to my attention two weeks ago. Ava Zadarzinska, a writer and filmmaker, 
has created a quality series called Poetry Unites America. Each film focuses on a particular state. An essay writing contest is held and the winners are featured in the unscripted film. The subject of the essay is the significance of a particular poem in my life. Ava has already completed two films, Poetry Unites New York and Poetry Unites Kansas, which are beautifully done and can be found on the web. You should look these up. She's in the planning stages now for the third film in the series, Poetry Unites Kentucky. She chose our state, she told me, because for one thing, it's widely known that Kentucky is a writerly state. Her words, I chuckled to myself that this phrase, used by Jim Wayne Miller 30 years ago or so, has made the rounds and come back home. There are examples of plenty that Kentucky is a writerly state. One example is all of us gathered here to celebrate another Kentucky Writers' Day, and I know there are other celebrations around the state today. Ava has asked me to be one of the judges of the essay contest, but first <clears throat> I'll be asked to spread the news about the contest throughout Kentucky, which I'm happy to do with the help of arts organizations and news outlets in the state. I readily agreed to be one of the judges, especially after she mentioned that she expects two of the former judges, Robert Pinsky and Edward Hirsch, plan to be involved in this film. As many of you know, Pinsky is a former poet laureate of the United States. Hirsch is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. I'll be honored to be a part of this. Current plans are for the contest to be launched this September and filming to take place next February, March, and April. This is obviously a wonderful opportunity for poetry and the arts in Kentucky. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. And finally, I also want to thank the Kentucky Arts Council for organizing this event and on a personal level, for three Al Smith fellowships during the time I was trying to find my footing as a Kansas, as a, but slip there, as a Kentucky poet. <laughs> and to the previous Kentucky Poets Laureate, those here today and those absent, I have all of your books on my shelves and return to them often. I'd like to end with a poem of mine, which I wrote on the back porch of our Cave Run Lake cabin a week after my retirement from UK. The title of this poem is Another Eight to Five on the Porch of Our Cave Run Lake Cabin. All afternoon, I happily crawl through a book of Jim Harrison's poems and watch a tawny, fat orb weaver fashion a net between shag bark hickory and white ash. Then it's my job to note nuthatches hopping down the trunk of a sugar hackberry to pillage the bird feeder. After a coffee break, I monitor the drinking binge, the fake petals of our feeder irresistible, of the ruby-throated hummingbird. Sit quiet as sandstone as two wild turkeys flutter and primp in a spotlight of sun. Next on my schedule is a 4.30, I'm right on time, with Johnny Walker. <laughs> the one drink I allow myself these days, which helps me adjudicate the squeaking complaints of two plump jays bluffing each other over a piece of rye toast. Then a goldfinch, sleek shard of sun, lands on the crossbeam four feet away and looks me in the eyes for 25 seconds. I sit back and let go a long breath. This is the work I was born for. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>